Welcome back for the second part of our trip down to Ben and Sarah Dooley's. If you didn't see the first video, I've come for a recce to learn a bit more about how they farm their beef and sheep farm, which Ben showcases at his channel, Deep South Sheep and Beef. The last video covered our morning when Ben and Sarah were weaning and sorting ewes and lambs. These just need to be turned back out to grass in their new groups. This afternoon, Ben has very kindly offered to take us around the farm and talk farming. More about their sheep enterprise, how the beef cattle fit into the picture, preparing for winter cropping, wintering cattle on a feed pad, his take on regenerative farming, farming regulation in New Zealand, how to deal with too much grass, how to close gates, optimising shelter belts for sheep, ground nesting birds, and I think that's it. Anyhow, he's a man with a lot of knowledge and a lot of opinions, but who's open to discussion. Leave any responses in the comments and I'm sure we will see them. First though, we're shifting these news and lamps. Walla go, Paul! What is that you're shouting, by the way, Ben? Because walla go. I don't know. It's, it's, a just, a, it's just a term I've heard <laughs> elsewhere. Like, walla go. It's, a, it's just what we're always taught. Hey, it I'll, means come back. Cool, but, yeah. yeah. But I just, I've got no idea where it came walla from. Walla go. Pretty sure it actually came from the UK, actually. Maybe it is. Maybe, it, maybe it's just something I've not come across. Yeah. Maybe oh, I was watching on the scales. Will I go, Paul? Will I go, Paul? A lot of them go through at 36.5. Yeah. You see, if that was rhombies, as soon as that one looked, the whole lot would have been down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I do like the rhombies, but they can be a bit challenging to work with the top. <laughs> You might be wondering why that gate's left like that. We do get a lot of lambs get stuck behind gates when they're wedged hard close. So as much as that looks like an epic fail, <laughs> there is a little bit of reason behind it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, good marketing. I just <laughs> forgot to check them this morning. Don't need to go through it. There you go. Outside, outside. Oh, guys. Outside. <laughs> Quiet, outside. Easy. Ideally, they have yeah. the gate sitting there yeah. like that. And then they get them behind it and they get stuck. And then die. Well, we haven't had that happen, but you've got to physically get them out of there. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you leave them slightly ajar, which, which is not good for the OCD in anyone. Yeah, yeah. Hey I ho. should have come around this morning and checked all these and tied them back, but yeah, at 6.30 this morning, I didn't really want to <laughs> so. I hope no dairy farmers heard that one. Anyway, next up is probably one of the biggest challenges to livestock farmers in Britain and New Zealand. How to keep their livestock, their land, and their livelihoods in good health over the winter. Yeah, so we can stop and have a look for Yeah, you yeah. Uh, these, so Swedes. The Swedes, yep. So these have been in four. So what's that? Call it 12 days. Uh, so we do everything ourselves apart from the planting. The planting's done with a very, very special bit of kit, a uh -huh. precision planter, which to be fair, right on, yeah, yeah, that's them. Right on the headland here isn't looking very precise, but. <laughs> um, I'm sure they are. It's early days. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, we'll get in the middle and have a look. Yeah, here's, here's a line where they're coming through. So you can see this, there should be one here, and it could well be there. They're not a mono germ. Okay. So they, do, they don't strike particularly evenly, but that's the spacings. That one right there is a fodder beat. All oh, right, so you've got a bit of fodder beat in there yeah. as well. <laughs> Just accidentally. Oh, I see. Yeah, so that's the difference between beet emerging and Swedes emerging. I can suppose that's a brassica. Yeah, and here's the More. seed. So actually, I'll pull that one out and show you. See how that Split, coating yeah. fell to bits? Yeah. That wee blue thing inside is the actual seed. Hopefully we'll be able to see that, but yeah. if you can't see it, you'll have to There's trust me. There's another one right there, actually. 
Um, so we get the seed coated, so it goes through these planters a lot better. Yeah. If these are the people watching this that haven't watched much of yours, what, do you, what are you using this for? This, this, is, our, this is our winter crop, so this right, is our okay. winter grazing. So all for sheep. Yep. Um, so we've got 20 hectares, yep. or 50 acres, we're just shy this year. Yep. And the idea here is that we graze our sheep on this over winter, one, to make sure we can feed them adequ adequately through winter. Yes, important. And two, so that we have adequate feed to lamb on. Yep. And it's all a balancing act down this end of the country. It's, it's really tricky. If we get to this time of year, which you'll see as we're cruising around the farm, mm. we do not have enough stock on to control the place. And we're already making a large amount of baleage. Mm. Sheep don't do that well eating just baleage. Oh, well, yeah. uh, they need to be eating, I want to say, minimum 70% grass or grazing crop yeah yeah if you try and feed them just baleage or hay they are just going to lose weight like crazy so this is part of our balancing act between controlling the grass at this time of year uh -huh. with the number of stock we have and then getting through winter when we don't grow enough feed yeah and one thing i like to think you'll see here is you hear a lot of talk about the regenerative side of things uh -huh. and I'm, I'm not against that people are completely able to do whatever they want to do yes and i'm a big believer in that uh trying to apply it down here when we lose quality stock don't do well no and sheep especially i think sheep are incredibly fussy on it you can get even dairy cows to a certain extent they'll get fat they yeah. might not milk that well but they'll get fat on rough feed but the ewes don't and yeah. the lambs certainly don't yeah um which is why we try to keep that quality up yeah so it's all about a balancing act and i know some people don't like this winter cropping thing and i can understand why when all you do is look at sheep on a paddock of crop yeah to be fair 95 percent of the time it is a nice thing to look at when the yeah. weather's good and we do have a system in place where basically if we think things are getting a bit sloppy we'll run them off yeah you can see that in the uh, like in your video absolutely. Like last absolutely. Winter, you, yeah, you have yep. grass paddocks or something you can yep. you, if it gets horrible and it does get horrible it sometimes, absolutely does like we live in south and it rains all winter <laughs> well, it doesn't rain all winter when it does rain it, it knows rains. how to rain yeah and it doesn't drain away the same because we don't have the growth we don't have the warmth in the soil no. so um but yeah the the <sighs> It is a balancing act. One, we don't want the animals in the in, in a sea of mud. No, nope. we don't want that. No. Nope. Two, we don't want the sea of mud. We're farming soil. We're yeah. farming sheep here, but first and foremost, we're we're utilising the soil to make income. Okay. So we want to protect that as well as we can. Uh, the third thing is we're spending a lot of money to grow a very very high yielding crop. We don't want to waste that. No, no, no. Exactly. We don't it's want all to money. Bury it. So and with cattle it's a bit easier you have you have a wire running mm -hmm. down the paddock the cattle are standing here and the crops out here and the cattle eat underneath mm -hmm. so they're not standing on their crop can't do that with sheep no nope. what they're eating they're standing on so there's lots of reasons why we do that running off thing yes but welfare definitely is right up there with with one of the main the big reasons i know there's a lot of talk about this practice around the place but my personal view is that we need to do better and we have done better than we were five years ago we don't need to get rid of it because it, the benefits from this which if you look back at our last lambing videos i know there weren't many there uh the feed we had around was just phenomenal tremendous are, are you who's about to lamb or has just started lamb it yes. so it just has just lambed and start, just started feeding her, her lambs it's a real welfare issue if she hasn't got enough in front of her to eat because that is the most metabolically demanding Absolutely. time of the year it's not good for her it's not good for the lambs mastitis worms all of these things will just pile on top yep. of her so it's a real balancing act it is and the way i look at it the ewes handle this pretty well yeah the hoggets are a bit more susceptible to it mainly because they're idiotic teenagers that run around in circles all day and make a heap of mud the ewes can handle a little bit of mud yeah far better than a newborn lamb can handle not enough oh, milk yes so if you want to look at it from a welfare point of view yeah. you've got to sort of take in the whole picture yeah. and you've got to sit there and say if we want the winter crop and gone are we happy to see massive amounts of dead lambs? And you're not lambing on this, I should, we should say, no, just, no, just in case. No. Like, the technical term is intensive winter grazing. That's, the one that's what they call it. We prefer to just so, say winter grazing. Winter grazing. Yeah. Regardless, it's yeah. you know, this, this forage crop that's specifically there for winter. There's not much left normally afterwards, is there? No. That's no. why you have these no. issues with mud. No one, at least, sh sh should be, and very. I can't think of anyone who would do it intentionally, lamb on that afterwards or carve on it afterwards. Yep. It's, yep. It's, it'd be a nightmare. Yep. Um, no, no one's wanting to do that. Just for a wee look here. Look yeah. at this fella. Um, we do plough, pear harrow. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> There's a big push for no-till yep. at the moment. And I'm certainly not against no-till. Yeah. But I just get a bit concerned that if we all do the one thing, every system has issues. Yeah. So there's there's issues potentially here with sediment runoff. We like to think we do the best we can to control it. Yeah. Um, if we all do this, 
then the waterways sediment wise are not going to be good. If we all go no till and we all use slug baits yeah, and glyphosate. we all use. Well, glyphosate is not really an issue. Okay. Oh, I've got to be careful saying that, but to be fair, there's not a lot of residual activity from no. glyphosate, or there's no activity. Um, glyphosate is the one I'd say is probably. It's probably one of the, the safest with. safest ag chemicals we have. We haven't used it here. No. Purely on cost. I mean, you can see yeah. there's a bit of grass around here on the headlands. Yeah. My view on it is that we need a happy medium of everything. Because if we all go no-till farming, then all of a sudden chemical residues are going to become an issue, and then that's going to be frowned upon. Yeah. So if we have a mix of everything, and a lot of guys around here are no-tilling, strip-tilling, whatever, so we're sticking with this in the hope that a combination of different practices will be good but for you the know industry. What? If everyone did the same thing, you would be no one to compare to and say, actually, we could do this. Yeah. But, yeah, he's doing yeah. quite well. She's doing quite well over there. Exactly. Maybe we should give that a go. Yeah, but I just, I just get really concerned about regulators when they see something good and they throw everything else out the window <laughs> and just focus on that one thing. Absolutely. Uh, problem in the UK as well. Sweet yeah, guys. definitely. So this bit here is locked up for bailers currently. It's okay. Not supposed to be. <laughs> Uh, but every year our hogger block gets way out of hand and this year it's been worse. So <laughs> There's this, no shortage of grass? No. So this paddock's splitting three breaks yeah. and I'm just pushing the hoggets a bit harder out the back here so I can yeah. hopefully top afterwards. But okay. the, oh, I'll get back in my wheel track so I don't flatten too much. <laughs> um, either side of the middle break is going to be done for baleage. Okay. And I just want them to graze that bit out the back hard enough so I can hopefully top it. But I don't like my chances. They're coming out of there tomorrow regardless. Okay, so those, those are your hoggets over there? Yeah. 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 They're looking pretty good this year, but I'm just hoping we don't have to put too much feed pressure on them to keep them looking good. And you're saying you don't lamb your hoggets? No. Here. No. no yeah. uh, never say never. No. But it's as, as close as you're going to get here. I'm not a fan of the practice with Romneys. Uh, it just gives you so many more options. Okay. Um, not, not talking about any welfare issues or anything like that. I've got no issue there, but... If we have a hard year, we can put pressure on our hoggets. Okay. If we're looking to lamb them, we can't. Okay. Um, normally when you have a hard summer, it's followed by a time that gives you options to get weight on your hoggets before their mating is tutus. Yep. So if you have to push them a little bit, you can do that. So does it give you some flex? It gives us a lot more flexibility. And yeah, this here is the next bit that's locked up for bailage. It is <laughs> not over here, but yeah. <laughs> I think you need more sheep. But that goes back to what we were saying actually about, about your, there's this big pinch point during the winter. Yeah. And it would be even worse if you couldn't grow those, those crops. winter crops. And this is absolute peak growth right now. Grass is too long to open the gates. <laughs> <laughs> Cultivate a bit down there is where our maize crops go yeah. in. Oh, maize, okay. And um, what are you going the maize for? Grazing. Oh, okay. It's a plant that likes dry. Yeah. And we did it a couple of years ago as a bit of an experiment for a winter thing and thinking that with cattle on crop, the principle was if we put maize beside it yeah. and the maize didn't fall over, um, that we would expand the area they were covering because yeah. with the cattle on crop here, with the heavy weights of crop, we've got this issue where the stock density is too high. Okay. And we're just, we're making too much mud. Our sheep crop paddocks, we can get sown out back out in September, early October, yeah. weather permitting. Um, our cattle didn't come off till the 1st of October, but we went in well into November before we could book it doing much. Yeah. And there's a line down the paddock where the cattle were, it just seemed to stay yellow compared to the sheep. So it's costing us more to do what we're doing now, but I think long term it's going to be better. But the idea was if we gave them more area, the stock density would reduce. Okay. And obviously the maize was going to be cheaper to grow yes. than it was to feed the baleage out. Fair enough. Okay. Had this great idea that maybe if we planted it late and it stayed green, then it wouldn't fall over. You're grazing it as like a standing crop almost. Besides, so it was planted beside the sweets. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, principle was yeah that if we planted it late, the frost wouldn't affect it so much. I uh, don't know why we thought that, because the exact opposite was true. <laughs> but what it proved is we could grow 12 to 14 tonne of reasonably high quality dry matter yeah. in 90 days. Really? And it was just nicer to look at than turnips. Sheep don't like turnips. Not no. here, they don't anyway. We're going to plant it with a thing called crimson clover, which yes. will actually climb up, hopefully. Right. Um, and it'll be a single one-off graze in blocks over summer. So end of February, start of March. I was kind of hoping it would be planted by now, but... He's hoping to be here on Monday. I'd say okay. with the weather at the moment, it'll be Wednesday before it gets here. That's over. interesting, clover and maize. Just just the sheer volume you can actually grow. Yeah. Um, and the idea is that with the drought we had last year, if we had two and a half hectares of something yeah. green to feed the tutus especially, we would have just jumped on it. 
Interesting. So it may wind up being a problem this year in the sense that we may have too much grass <laughs> and the ewes might be required to be on cleanup duty yeah. the whole time. But if that is the case, we'll find something to do with it. And in the States, like grazing cattle on corn stalks, they would call it. Yes. Like, they love yeah. that. They do. And Real this cheap. is essentially all this is. It's just yeah. the... The greener version. The green, yeah. But the, and being green, it'll be higher in protein. Yeah, Hello. How could a Sean Hoggett be cast? <laughs> I bet she's not. I bet she's just having a stretch. We'll get up. Oh, I'm not so sure. Oh, no, she's on there. There we go. Been, yeah, no, she might not have been down too long. They're, they're looking running pretty, away okay. Yeah, they're looking pretty good, these things. Um, I don't know what weights they'd be. A uh, local consultant reckon they'd be nudging 60 kilos. So definitely be the best we've ever had them. And looking at them, they are the best we've ever had them. Yeah. But thistles out here are having a great time. <laughs> Everything's having a great time. We're not a huge place, like it's 250 hectares, which by New Zealand standards for sheep and beef is not big. But I'd say it, you could grow a lot of grass for a beef and sheep yes. farm. Yes, yeah. And you've got to be a little bit careful with the amount of grass we've got now. This is not normal. <laughs> uh, we had a major, major drought last year. Yeah. And part of our recovery plan from that was that we put 15 tonnes of urea on 180 hectares. Okay. Ah, uh, what's the term? It's strategic, not systemic yet. And I'm completely of the opinion, like when it comes to lambs and fattening cattle, I am not going to feed them a maintenance ration. If they are here, and I have the option to, they're going to get fed a fattening ration. Trying to feed lambs a maintenance ration is near on impossible anyway. Um, they keep growing frame, so if you feed them the maintenance, they're not going to keep condition. No. And then you just wind up in a real bad spot. So, so just skinny, big lambs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Which are great for a store buyer. Yeah. Not so great for a store seller. No. <laughs> what sort of stock numbers are you running here? So we're running, it, it, it's changed a bit year to year the last few years, yeah. but between 2200 and 2450 use. Okay. We're going to settle somewhere between 2300 and 2350, I think. Okay. Um, we used to run 2450, and then we introduced 50 cattle into the mix, which we buy as young calves. Okay. Four day old calves, and we rear and take through to finishing at 18 months. And they're like dairy crosses, presumably yes. you're buying them at age all, all dairy beef, yep. Yep. Uh, so do dairy beef so they're, they're um, a Frisian cross with a, a Hereford or yeah. a, we've got some Belgian blues at the moment got some Charolais last year which is still here as you know, they're going to be killed this March okay they've done really well and Angus to call it 2300 ewes uh, lambing at an average of 140 ish percent yeah which were 142 141 142 this year oh, is that tailing is that tailing that's, that's, so that's ewes mated Okay. Two lambs tailed. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And so that losses, includes all your barons. That's everything. And your yeah. wet dries. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the only lambing percentage that actually counts. The ones you get paid for, basically. <laughs> exactly. Isn't it? And even it, the tailing's not completely representative because you do have some losses after tailing. Yeah. But we're normally around that one and a half percent. So survival to sale is the big one. And on that, our average would be around that 139%. Um, so you'll, you'll often hear figures of 180, 190% thrown around. Some people do genuinely achieve that, yep. and I take my hat off to them. They've done amazingly well. But normally what you're hearing there is a through-the-pennant tailing percentage. So no dries, no death rate factored in, yeah. no wet dries factored in. Um, yeah, it's a bit of pub talk, really. And how much permanent pasture do you have versus like plat? How much do you renew? We're 250 hectares. There's about 50 hectares that will never cultivate, regardless of okay. what regulation says. I mean, we've got these banks and stuff along yeah. here. We'll go as extreme as we feel we can without losing soil. So we put it around 200 hectares we can cultivate. Okay. And we do 20 hectares a year into sweets. We're sort of in a bit of a horrible phase at the moment. We'd love to cut our winter crop back to 16 hectares. Okay. But we don't know whether that's going to work or not. But with all this regulation coming in, we're very scared of a thing called grandparenting happening. Okay, and what's, what's that? Which is, you've done this much for so long, so that's all you can do in the future. So you want to maintain that if that comes in? Yeah. Just think for, for flexibility in the future, you might want to maintain that. That's right. So if, if we do that for a couple of years and decide we don't want to do it, yeah. and then that two years of 16 hectares is in the period where they select the, four, say, a five-year average, then all of a sudden we're, we're cut short on what we can plant. Yeah. Um, and I'd love for this to just all be finished, but they keep putting stupid stuff in it and we'll keep having to fight it. So, yeah, it, it becomes a nightmare. And right. this is the problem with the regulation they're proposing. Farmers always want to do what's right, yeah. generally, and, and do the best thing. But we take a far more holistic view of it and we yeah. factor more stuff in. Whereas they're focusing on, on one single matter and they're targeting that. And we're sitting there going, okay, 
how do we work around this? Because it's just in our nature, it's what we do. But that's, that's enough on regulation. That, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, getting back to the sheet, all your, all your user Romneys, aren't they? Pure yes, Romneys. that's right. And you have sort of like a, it, some farms call it an A and a B flock, right? So, yeah, we do. So we, we have a system where all of our turtles start off yeah. as a maternal ewe, yeah. but they all go to a terminal ram. Okay. Because we just find the terminals do better out of them. Okay. Uh, so the four tooth, which is a three-year-old, so their second lambing, they're the first year we'll keep replacements from. Okay. Um, and the basic setup, it, it's basically a two-strike policy. One strike, they get a yellow tag in the rear. Yes. Um, now that might be having an assisted lambing. Yeah. That might be having to have a lamb mothered onto them, be it their own or something else. But yeah, lots of different things factor into that, and it depends on the season as to how aggressive you get in that. You get a snowstorm at lambing, you might not be so hard on your, yes, on your two. Yes, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, you have a beautiful lamb in the whole way through and there's no issues, then everything that doesn't rear its own lamb is going to get um, sent to the works, basically. All based around lambing time. Mm. So the rest of the year doesn't really matter. Yeah, this little shelter belt here is one that we haven't planted out yet. All right, so we, there's that shelter belt to go in. Yeah, we put the posts in and then we tried to get the trees and the trees we wanted they didn't have. <laughs> so we put a couple of ewes with their lambs in there for a few weeks and just opened the gate the other day to let them back out. Uh, out of interest, <laughs> what are the trees you want? Play landies or macrocarpa for okay. here. Okay. We're going to put a mix in all around the place. So some will be yeah. natives. <clears throat> uh, we've got one just at the other end of the Swede paddock here that's yeah. actually in um, poplars. Okay. It's on a boundary fence so we didn't want anything that was going to hang over. Macrocarpa yeah. potentially could cause abortion issues and Leylandis, are, well, the green Leylandis are a half macrocarpa apparently nice. so there's issues there. So, But that one there is going to be max because we want big trees that are going to let air flow through okay. but slow it down which the idea is it stops them camping underneath. What happens with a hedge, you've got a short hedge row, they, they go in underneath and then it just turns to mud in the middle of lambing. You get a whole lot of sheep there lambing there, get mixed up, they get confused. I don't want to be able to notice much difference standing at the shelter belt. Okay. I want to be able to walk a 50 or 100 metres out in the paddock and feel that the edge has been taken off. Interesting, fine tuning these things. Yeah, trying to slow the air movement uh, as opposed to trying to stop it. Okay. Yeah. Over the fence here we've got the Tudus. So they've all gone to a pole horse at Ram. Yeah, so that's your other terminal, so we, yes. look, we're still, we were looking at the South Down earlier. Yeah, I would say on average these are looking a lot better than the South Downs. So okay. these, these are, and this, this mob we're in here is actually all, all the triplets. All these lambs were born as triplets and they were treated pretty well. Yeah. They lambed on like 2,000 cover at a very low stocking rate. <sighs> they get babied, it's not efficient, but what we've noticed since we started doing it is we don't get the ewe wastage. Okay. We don't feed the ewes as well as we used to over winter because we used to get riding to feed them heaps of nuts mm -hmm. and these things would be massive and we'd bring them in the yards to give them their pre-lamb vaccine and drench yeah. and we'd let them out, they've been in the yards 45 minutes and they'd start falling over <laughs> milk fever. They're getting all the grass they can eat. Yeah. Uh, we did put them back on Swedes for a couple of weeks this year after scanning and that worked really well but basically for the for the whole last six weeks of, gest of gestation they're ad-lib fed on grass and clover but no extras. The extras just seem to, to make them fall over a bit. And then we land them on a huge amount of feed. Because um, they've always been on a huge amount of feed, you don't get the prolapses to the same level. Um, and they don't you don't get the milk fever issues going the other way. If you take them off half some feed and spread them out on not enough. And the lambs have done pretty bloody well. I would say so. Yeah. I'd be pretty pleased with them with the mine anyway. Definitely. Uh, the South Downs we're looking at before. Those are our worst use. Yes, yeah, Our yeah, worst yeah. use are in there, and some of them are only at the same age as these guys. Yeah. So, yeah. to compare... Maybe not, a fair, maybe not a fair comparison. We're not, we're not comparing breed side by side. I think the South Downs have actually done better this year than the Polies did in the same situation last year. Yeah, Ben was just saying, you know, if, if any of you guys have weaned lambs or seen weaned lambs, they often go, they're upset. You they know, they it's, stress. This is probably, the, has the potential to be the most stress, apart from perhaps being born, Yep. probably the most stressful day of their life. So anything you can do to manage that better can only be a good thing, right? Absolutely, yeah. So, so if you look, these are the lambs we had going through the pens earlier. These are the, the smaller ones, aren't they? Yes, these are the ones that aren't going to the works. So they've been, they've been weaned and you can, I think all the sounds coming from that end. Yeah, <laughs> there's, that there's, a, the there's a couple up here in this corner that are bleeding yeah. out, but they're just sitting down, they're eating, they're just, <clears throat> they seem very relaxed. Yeah, and, and I, I think having, certainly there are farmers at home who, who are adamant that when you wean lambs, yep. you should, if you can, put take the, the ewes away from the lambs. And put the lambs back where they were. Exactly. It's an interesting concept. I've never actually thought of that. But we have noticed the last four or five years at weaning, 
we're not seeing the check. Yeah. Uh, when, I, when I say that, like obviously you not see you, the check. You don't. Yeah. <laughs> you, don't, you don't see it in the land so much, but <clears throat> we know what used to cause the check. Yeah. Was that for a week after weaning, we'd get them in this paddock on the hill up here. Yeah. And they'd there. go and camp back in that gateway, and they would stand there for days and bleat. And they're not eating. They're unhappy. Yep. They're stressed out. Exactly. They just they're in a really bad place. Whereas I'm looking around this paddock right now and. This is the most relaxed I've ever seen them. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, uh, you must be doing something right. Yeah. I mean, imagine being taken away from your parents at, yeah. uh, I guess in human terms, like boarding say school. 10 years old. Yeah. And yeah, but at least with that, you, you're told what's happening. <laughs> These guys have got no understanding of it. And yet they're just, just happy. happily days. You see yeah. all of that, they're just away. Most of them sitting down, grazing. Yeah, I've yep. been to, there's a few perhaps. Yep. A bit, a bit perturbed, maybe up there in the corner, but the vast majority of them either eating or sat down during the cud. I would say in a couple of days, they'll have forgotten all about it too. Yep. Over to the mixed age ewes now, the backbone of the flock. They're on a new grass reseed, which has its advantages, but also disadvantages, as you'll see. And alongside the new grass that's been planted, there is an unwelcome guest. And like this fat hen here, yeah. what we'll do after this grazing. You can't do it before the first grazing because it needs the sheep's feet on the paddock to sort of pack it down a bit. Okay. On these hills, especially when it's a bit wet. Um, we will fold the covers up in the mowers mm -hmm. and mow it at sort of 10, 12 k's an hour. And then we'll put a little bit of DAP on the paddock for a bit okay. of nitrogen and capital for it. And you will almost never see them again. You might have to do that once more. Um, and then the weeds are gone. Fat hen is a problem because fat hen seeds from the minute it starts grazing. Okay. But it is one in the future that is easy enough to take out if we... Uh, if you need to. Yeah, we... This is probably the worst we've seen fat hen in areas like this. Yeah. But it's only in a few small areas. So next time we put this in Swedes, which will hopefully be 10 years away, we will see what the fat hen's like in the Swedes. Yeah. If we think it's a problem, we'll spray for it. Let's call it regenerative. <laughs> yeah. Multi-species yeah. sword. Hey, look, the regen thing. Um, I'm anti-regulators talking about it as I'm anti-regulators with everything because yeah. they just get so much wrong. Yeah. Uh, my personal view is that actually a lot of New Zealand agriculture is pretty close to region. Okay. Uh, you see this miss out here? Yeah. That's one of my pet projects. That was where yeah. an oyster catch nest was. The miss further over, I'm going to claim it was a trial. Yeah. Apparently you do need seed to get grass to strike. <laughs> um, but yeah, that one there was an oyster catch nest. I could have got closer to it, but they were pretty close to hatching and yeah. uh, well, they did hatch three days later. Um, Fantastic, rather than rolling them over with them. Yeah, tractor. the little plovers. I hate plovers. They're they're an imported or they're self-imported. They don't get the same treatment, and they also dive bomb your tractor. And they've got a little hook in the end of the wing. Is that right? Yeah, but the oyster catchers are native. Yeah, so every, every young grass paddock seems to get a miss in it from an oyster catching nest. <laughs> native species, you've got to look after these things. Yeah. It's like the paradise ducks. As much as we hate ducks, paradise ducks are native, and they're not in big numbers here. Yeah. So we do have a habit of leaving them alone. The okay. mallards are a different story. I was going to shoot back up here because yeah. I thought I might have seen a cast you up here, but... See, that fat hen looks bad, but if you come back in six weeks' time, yeah. you won't see it. The combination, the sheep will graze it. You've got to put a bit of pressure on them to do it, but yeah, mainly the mowing. And notice how it's worse up on top of the knob here? Yes. I don't know whether that's because they camp here or whether because something's ripped in a bit deeper in cultivation or what it is, but... It, yeah, who it, knows where yeah. the seed bank was or... Yeah, you can just see throughout the paddock, there's the odd, there's patches of it, but a lot of the paddock is pretty clean. Yeah, so, odd that. Yeah, not an issue at this stage, but moving forward, if it becomes an issue, we will just have to adopt spraying. Hello. Got one the other day that was, um, she was choking as we got there. Oh, really? Oh, perfect. You got well, we got her up. See, like I said to you before, these ears come in here yesterday. So this is not, it's not like she's what? been lying she's... down for days. No, no. She got up a bit better than the last one did, but... Uh... And it's, it's like perfectly flat as well, yep. you know what I mean? You went, there's no rig there. No, they just, they just lie down, they roll over for a scratch. Yeah. And yeah, that's what happens. <laughs> but yeah, you're saying you had plenty of trouble with that this year, just with how yep. conditioned just they are, just the, flat backed. The weight on the ewes and the feet around, oh, with a bit of clover there, they get quite gassy as well. Yeah. Grass is growing really fast and lush. So what happens is when they roll over, they get stuck. Often they'd be able to kick and fight for a few minutes and they get back up. But because they're upside down, I don't, you'll know more about it than me. Seems to be when they're upside down, they get gassy. Yeah. Whether they can't get rid of it or what, it's I don't know. It's lack of being able to get rid of it, yep. exactly that. Yeah. And it doesn't take long for it to build up. And we're no. always told they can die in as little as eight minutes. Yeah. There's so, another one there. 
Oh, crikey. <laughs> we'll go get her. <laughs> that's that's yeah. number three in, in this paddock, just within about, I don't know, a couple of hundred metres of each other. Yeah, this is the, the fresh, first grazing yeah. young grass, though, and it is, it's good stuff, it is the worst for it. Yeah, a few weeds around, but we'll tidy that up in the mower. Yeah, quite often they're just on their sides, yeah. and they get up and run away easy as, but we waste, I shouldn't say waste, we spend two to three hours every day at this time of year. Spin around them. Yeah, come on, girl. Yeah, you haven't been down very long. Whoop. Uh, whoop, whoop, just whoop. just going around checking for this. Well, quite often there'll be nothing. Yeah. But the argument is if you leave it for two days, you might wind up going around picking up dead sheep. Dead ones, yeah, and exactly. A, they're worth a lot of money, and B, I don't really like the idea of a sheep lying on its back choking to death. You can sort of see they're a lot more consistent in size. Like, there's yeah. big ones and little ones, but compared to that early lambing mob, because there was such a variation in age in that yeah. this year, um, they are more consistent. Yeah. These guys have got three weeks to go to weaning, so we'll get a few out of here. There's 1,600 <laughs> of these, including the South Downs that we weaned this morning, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So, yeah, 1,300 of these in total. We have 31 50-odd lambs for the year. 31 so, 50. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, plenty to keep you busy. Systems in place to make it easy. I mean, like yeah. I say, we're a pretty small-scale place. I did used to work on a farm that had 42,000 ewes, 1,000 breeding cows. In New cows. Zealand? In New Zealand, only 100 k's away. Uh, 3,500 hinds as well. But it was 170,000 acres. Different so. scales. This is like a small hole then. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is, this is Lifestyle this, block. Sorry, this is a cute. hobby farm, yeah. Hobby farm. Yeah. But you can see, just, so this is first year grass, isn't it? First yep. grazing. So this was Look sown in September, end of September. And like I say, there's a few weeds, a bit of nettle there. Yeah, but definitely. This stuff, fat hen, horrible stuff, but easy to deal to. Yeah. Mower does it, sheep do it. Worst case scenario, we spray, but um, yeah, it's it hasn't really tilled out much yet because it's first grazing. Okay. And that and, means, when you say tiller, that's so like... So if we look at these grass plants, yeah. each, so that's one plant, mm -hmm. each leaf's a tiller. So we try to get as many of those as possible from each plant, and that reduces this. So in, yeah. sheep, in sheep ground, we don't like seeing bare dirt. Mm -hmm. Our dairy's different. Dairy wants a, a grass plant that grows up, and okay. they get the yield out of it, Yeah. but they get weed issues. But they're going to get that anyway because of the just the nature of dairy yeah. farming. Yeah. Um, we don't get as much yield out of this as they do. But we have the option to, to try and choke out weeds and also means just the nature of sheep, they want to graze low. So the more dry matter per hectare we can have when they've grazed as low as they can, the better because the plant's going to rebound better. If we graze the dairy pasture down as low as sheep do, it would take months to come back. How old are these cattle here? So these are just over a year old, They're sort of in that 14, 15 months now I guess are they? Okay. So we call it 18 months, we kill them at, it's more like 20. Yes. But it's, it's before two year old, so they only get winded once. Between a year and a half and, and two years old. Basically. Yeah, that's when they get killed. Yeah. So I see some charolies there anyway. Yep. So, I mean, the Angus are the ones that tend to fatten up the best. You will see one Angus in there with horns. Obviously, <laughs> not an Angus. Uh, there might even be two of them. But yeah, I'm, considering they're, they get grain as calves in the form okay. of the calf pellets. Yep. But that's only in getting their guts ready for grass. Yep. So they're not, that room yeah, they're not 100% grass fed, but beyond that sort of three months of age, they're 100% grass fed. And when you send them to the works at 18, 20 months, what sort of weight specs are you achieving? <sighs> so these are our lever that we can pull. Yeah. So we, we try to keep the lambs doing as well as we can uh, and take them as far as we can. Mm -hmm. The workspace here in New Zealand, once you get to the end of March, just disappears because okay. the dairy cull comes on. Okay. We know that's coming, so there's no point grizzling about that. It's the way it is. We were open to starting killing these things in February. Yeah. Um, there'll be some of the bigger ones will go. And I mean, we've always got a goal in the back of our head of about 270. I don't think yeah. we've ever hit it. But like I say, these are a lever that we pull. So we can quit these, we can sell them store. Yeah. We can um, kill them at lower weights. We'll offload these yeah. and focus on trying to hold lambs because we know we can get lamb space through April, May quite comfortably. Yeah. Again, flexing that stock number is a bit like your hoggets. Exactly. Just gives you a bit more flex and, and, and also, I suppose, you know, maintain the quality of grazing and things like that. Maintain yeah. your pars you know, parasite burdens. And and we don't have a, you know, the, bur the, the parasite thing is definitely something here. Yeah. But the bigger one for us, that we or the big one that we don't have is the pasture control side of things like okay. we need to keep feeding these things to keep them doing because at any point we can sell them and the heavier they are the more they're worth so yeah it becomes a bit of a uh, well, we don't we don't get that thing you get when you've got beef cows having calves because yeah, you can okay. really push them like they live on the smell of an oily rag and they rear a calf while doing it and so they get growing cattle so they're a bit more demanding dead right the beef cow thing is just awesome we'd love to have beef cows here 
I'd love to go down to 2,000 ewes and run, say, 80 or 100 cows, but the wintering thing here is just too much of an issue. Just kill you. We can winter one type, one, uh, one yeah. group of cattle in the pad. If you put, try and put three age groups up there, that's not going to work. Because no. obviously you've got the cow, you've got the calf, and then you've got the, the yearlings as well. Yes, yeah, it's just um, a mess. Be a mess yeah. very quickly anyway. you'd, you'd need three setups, and that just, it, it's just not a practical setup. Ben said earlier he's gotten away from wintering cattle on a forage crop like fodder beet or swedes, which is pretty standard practice here. So, what does he do with them over the winter instead? He keeps them here. There's a few, well, there's a couple of pine trees in there that were planted to replace ones that had fallen down, and we are actually going to replant another one out there. Okay, because this isn't going to last forever. All right, so we, we're just coming to the to the end because my GoPro is starting to run out of battery, and, and, and Ben's probably got better things to do with his time. But we're essentially at Ben's cattle shed. <laughs> yeah, probably be the term for it, right? And you can see photos of this in action on his channel if you go and have a, some of his winter videos. But this is what you, a feed pad. Feed, feed it's, pad. it's a form of feed pad. Yeah. 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 So you will have to excuse the mess here. This was done a little bit makeshiftly because we were supposed yep. to have a digger here in February. Yeah, and it turned up in June. <laughs> the cattle were already up here. So, so how many cattle do you keep on here, and of what like uh, stock class? Fifty rising one-year-olds. Okay. So yep. they they go on in May. They're mm -hmm. not a year old at that stage, and they come off in end of September okay. when they're just over a year old. But this whole area here is rocked, and basically what I've got to do is all this feed. I've got to remove it. And we are going to try and put it through a muck spreader. So you come out here with a digger, load it into the muck spreader. Yeah, I'll probably just use the. I like your brushes. <laughs> yeah, that was my wife's contribution. <laughs> uh, she said they had to be done, so, yeah. and they do use them. So this area here isn't. So look, the rock sort of ends here. Yeah. And this is like that's where a bale feeder was the mm -hmm. previous year when we had a, just 20 cattle up here. Yeah. They don't seem to make much mud up here. We're right on top of the hill, so there's no catchment coming in here at all. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're pretty simple. Just a bit of box section. <laughs> all they are is the brush off a sweep truck. Is that right? So they've just got a square thing inside, slide it over there, weld that on top. The, um, use it. the whole side over there, they'll never sink in. And what you'll find is you'll come up here, they'll go up there, they'll eat, they'll drink. Yeah. They'll come back over here and they'll camp. They'll be like their dry lie. Yeah. So this over behind us here, they've got this strip over here yeah. as well. Yeah. And because of the way the trees are and all the bark off the trees and stuff over the years, they, they don't make any mud over there at all. Awesome. So there's areas that are muddy and it always looks bad where they feed, Yeah. but it's not as bad as it looks. It's raised up on a lot of rock. We are going to try and improve, we are going to improve on that a lot this year. Um, the wastage out of these ring feeders was huge. We probably wasted 20% of the feed. That thing there, if I was only putting one bale yeah. in it, we're probably wasting two or three percent. To be fair, twenty percent is probably not far if you were doing, you know, the trendy thing and and feeding out on pasture and rolling bales. Yeah, you'd probably yeah. be wasting twenty percent, right? I would say you'd be wasting all yeah. of that. Um, but in this area here, the idea is that we want the nutrients going to the animal, not the ground, because this isn't an area yeah. that we want to try and regenerate, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we're going to get another couple of those, and we'll just it'll wind up being it'll start off every three days we come up, so yeah. three bales for three days, and then as we get through and they start eating more, it'll be three bales for two days. Okay. And they'll they'll be pretty good at letting me know when that is it'll be um, you'll be able to hear them from home I well imagine. just quite simply they're, they're ad lib fed yeah they've got so. a good view as well yeah dinner dinner yeah. and a view <laughs> um it's an interesting spot this like and i've never seen anything quite like it. Uh, it it's a different way to do it there's still mud here no doubt yeah but they've always got dry areas to camp yeah and i just i just i like getting them off the paddocks i'm not against winter cropping with cattle but we were just seeing things in our operation that we couldn't seem to mitigate okay um, other people have different things they're doing, but yeah. This works for you? This is what works for us. The idea of leaving the grass strips and that does work for a lot of people, but it interferes with their regrassing program and, and chemical programs and everything, so we've just chosen to go this way. Nice one. Don't, well, I should probably leave you there. <laughs> no, good as gold, man. Uh, if you haven't already checked it out, go and check out uh, Ben's channel. It's Deep South Sheep and Beef. I need to get my mouth around That's that. Very good. Uh, and you'll be able to see things like this in the winter and, and throughout his farming calendar and like what the farm looks like at different times of the year because it'll be quite radically different it is. in six months time it is. and then yep. another six months. It's just sort of showing what we're doing throughout the year yeah. and probably a little bit too much but an explanation of why we do what we do. And it just yep. gives you another perspective on how people do things which yep. I think it can only be a good thing. Exactly. Exactly. Sweet. Right. Catch you next time.